everyone. Hello. <laughs> okay, good afternoon. I'm very excited to see so many wonderful faces from our region here and um, to kick off our conference, even though you've already gone to a bunch of sessions. So um, good afternoon, my name is Mara Gould. I am conference co-chair along with Kristen Carey for our region conference this year, and I'm very excited to introduce our keynote speaker this, this afternoon, it's still afternoon. So um, it is my pleasure to introduce our keynote speaker, Dr. Tom Greitz. Our theme this year is returning to our roots, and Tom is returning to his as he was here 42 years ago in this very same hotel at the first conference on academic advising in 1977, which led to the founding of our organization in 1979. Tom's Nakata roots run deep. He is one of the founding members of Nakata, membership number 002. I've seen it. If you haven't seen the membership card, it's over in our mini museum. You can check it out along with the charter. He um, and served as our president for two terms. He currently serves as senior editor of the Nakata Journal and regularly provides other services, like today, to our organization. He has been at Stockton University for over 40 years, currently serving as assistant provost for academic support, overseeing academic orientation programming, first year experience efforts, transfer student initiatives, and teaching a seminar course for transfer students. Tom's scholarly achievements include over 50 journal, art, journal articles, book chapters, and professional reports, more than 120 conference presentations, faculty development workshops, and academic advising program reviews on over 100 campuses, and serving on the ABSCON Board of Education for over 30 years. Tom earned his Bachelor of Science and Master of Science degrees from Illinois State University and a PhD from the University of Maryland. Both institutions have awarded him distinguished alumni awards and he was inducted into the College of Education Hall of Fame at Illinois State in 2007. He was also recognized as a transfer champion by the Institute for the Study of Transfer Students in 2015. As Region 2 will say, we stole Tom for Region 1 this year. And I saw the text last night that they said it. And while he will leave Burlington to return to Atlantic City for Region 2's conference, which is literally happening right now, he will always be a part of Region 1. And we're so very happy to have him share his Nakata stories with us this afternoon. Please join me in welcoming Tom back to Vermont. I think the only thing you forgot to mention, Mara, was that I was vice president of my seventh grade class. <laughs> Both years. <laughs> now that I stole from somebody, and if anybody can figure out who I stole that from, it's somebody who's often cited in Nakata literature and advising literature, and, uh, and where I learned that from, why well, I'll buy each of you a, a drink at the, uh, at the reception. Uh, welcome to Nakata, okay? Uh, some of you are here for the, the, your first Nakata uh, experience, right? I know I sat in on the, the session today, so uh, welcome. Uh, this is, it was kind of an opportune, uh, uh, well, an opportunity for me to uh, talk to Mara and Melissa, I guess, where is she? Oh, she's hiding in the back. Uh, at the national conference in Phoenix when they asked me if I might be available to do this and realizing, we both realized that our two conferences, Region 1 and 2, were at exactly the same time, and I was supposed to be getting our president to speak at that, uh, at, be the keynote speaker for that. So he's there right now, keynoting the Region 2 conference. He's a former student of mine, by the way. Uh, <laughs> that's how old, <laughs> that's how long I've been around. Here. So anyway, it's given me a great opportunity to, uh, uh, 
reflect on a lot of the kinds of things that you can read some of the stories about in the Nakata literature, but uh, having lived through some of these experiences that I'll explain to you as we go along, I think, I think you'll enjoy some of them and appreciate some of them maybe in, in different ways. But anyway, uh, my top 10 plus two, I, it, there are 12 there, I added a couple today, so I had to make it be consistent with the title of the, uh, 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 of the talk as well. Um, because going back to the roots, the roots actually were in this hotel in 1977, uh, officially. But prior to that, how many, of you have, how many of you have not heard this elevator story? Oh, most of you, okay, so, all right. Well, uh, as you can see, it was April 1977 in Denver, Colorado at, a, at an ACPA conference. How many people are involved in ACPA or know of it at least? You'll find the early days and still some things uh, with Nakata were patterned after ACPA because that was the only institution that, or the only association that would actually accept a program, a conference program on advising. Okay, that was the only association. So I had two programs accepted for, for that conference and I was heading down on an elevator down to the uh, ground floor where the presentation was going to be and I was standing, this woman was standing right here and she's holding this flyer that says First National Conference on Academic Advising. So I tapped her on the shoulder and I said, what's this all about? And, and she said, well, I'm having this conference in Vermont and there's a guy giving a presentation downstairs. I wanna go down and see if he'll let me hand out these flyers. <laughs> so I said, I'm that guy, <laughs> okay? So Tony Trombley uh, came down. Uh, we exchanged business cards or whatever. It wasn't until probably 25 years later Probably it was uh, 25 years later when, <laughs> uh, when I was here for the Summer Institute in, in Burlington at this hotel also, and we went to Tony's house. She had long been away from, from academic advising. Uh, but I said, you know, I never knew why you, you decided to have a first national conference on advising. She said, well, she'd been appointed director of academic advising here uh, at the University of Vermont and she was traveling all over the country trying to figure out what people were doing in advising. She couldn't find any literature, she didn't know anybody, so she said, I'm just gonna bring the people to me. So her vice president gave her the, the authorization to have a national conference uh, here, and that's uh, you know, kind of how it started. So uh, we kind of, Tony and I, and we still keep in touch, I tried to get her to come today, but, but uh, she's in Florida, but anyway, uh, we keep in touch. And so we kind of consider ourselves uh, the mother and father of Nakata. So I guess at this stage, you're all of our grandchildren. <laughs> <laughs> it's not too far from the truth, I don't think, from, uh, from age anyway. So uh, anyway, that was the very, the very beginning. So the first conference uh, was in 1977, October 1977. Uh, I had just moved in, in August from University of Maryland to uh, Stockton, where I am now and have been since then. So I was only uh, at Stockton for like two months before we were coming here. Uh, we were uh, coming up here, there was somebody at a, one of our local community colleges who called me and said, are you going to this conference? And, and I said, yeah, why? And she said, well, are you driving or flying? And I said, well, I'm driving. I had a brand new Pinto. So I thought, oh, <laughs> yeah, I'll, I'll drive that. Uh, up here, and she said, well, I was wondering if I could get a ride with you. I said, sure. It was Peggy King, who was also a, a Nakata president, and uh, the first from any community college, so and Peggy and I are still good friends as well, so we drove up here. We'd never met, never seen each other before. Uh, I was leaving from Stockton, or no, I was leaving from, I hadn't moved yet from Maryland, so I was coming up Maryland, coming up the New Jersey Turnpike, and we agreed to meet at a rest area uh, on the New Jersey Turnpike. So here we are, I drive into the rest area. I have no idea what Peggy looks like. I don't know what car she's driving, but somehow she came out and we introduced each other and we made our 10 hour drive up here to, uh, uh, you know, to, to Burlington. Uh, she could not get a room in this hotel. She, she applied too late, but she was able to get uh, into the conference as, as another person. How many of you have read any of Virginia Gordon's work? 
in, in mostly in career and undecided students and so forth. Tony wouldn't allow Virginia Gordon to come to this conference, to the first conference, because she had applied too late. She hadn't heard about it. And, and they had more, no more room in the hotel. The rooms didn't hold any more people than the 250, uh, I think, that we had, that she had allotted for that first conference. So Virginia never got to come to the, uh, to the first conference, but certainly has made her mark with the association since then. But at that conference, there was just so much energy about advising. Everybody was talking about, we've got to start an association. I mean, that was just, that was on everybody's tongue and everybody's mind, you know, that this was such a good thing that we needed to do that. Uh, so we formed a, a steering committee of about, I'm guessing about 20, 20 people, and we started planning. Well, the first thing was we got to have another conference. So uh, Frank Dyer, one of the people from Memphis State, called his vice president and said, would you be willing to sponsor this conference in Memphis? And he got the okay from his vice president, who so said, all right, you know, we're going to, going to Memphis for the second conference. And then we started splitting up roles as to what we were all gonna have to do to try to get an association off the ground. So we're from all over the country, just working out of our offices and our homes and so forth, just trying to get some of this stuff together. And I volunteered, wanted to be the, the conference program chair uh, I had a strong <clears throat> feeling and commitment. I had published out there on the, the mini museum, you will see the uh, first, first significant, I won't say biggest, but significant publication about academic advising called Getting Us Through the 80s. This was 1979, okay? <laughs> so, made sense. We made it. Uh, <laughs> So I, I projected well there, I guess. But anyway, she said, you know, you're the only one's written anything that's, you know, that's of, of any substance or whatever. I don't know what language she used, but she said, uh, uh, okay, you, you better take care of the program. So I agreed to do that and, and asked to do that, and everybody else had all kinds of assignments uh, to, to do. So we had to start planning uh, the second conference, which, uh, as you see, was in... Uh, 1978 in Memphis, and uh, <clears throat> Tony and I met at another ACPA conference. This remember the elevator story. Now we're in uh, Detroit uh, at the ACPA conference, and and we were on the 75th floor of the Renaissance Hotel Center in Detroit. I don't know if you've ever been there, arguing about who we were going to have for a keynote speaker. Uh, I wanted. Uh, you know, I said, we've got to have somebody that's got a name that people recognize. So I wanted uh, Alexander Aston. So we called him and asked, you know, he said, $1,000 plus expenses. And she said, absolutely. Well, not over the phone, but uh, said, absolutely not. We can't afford that. I said, Tony, you've got to have somebody with a big name to draw to keep people coming to uh, a second conference so we can keep this thing going. So I finally won that argument. Uh, and we, we had uh, Alexander Aston for our, our keynote speaker. One other little story I forgot, uh, in that first conference, I said we had 250 people. One of the social activities that we had was a ferry boat ride out on Lake Champlain. The whole conference went on the, on the one <laughs> ferry boat. So I was thinking as I'm flying up here, I said, I wonder if they got a ferry boat plan for, for this conference. And then I flew across the lake and I said, I guess not because it's all frozen. So I'd forgotten about that. But, uh, and we did the same thing in Memphis. We had a riverboat ride uh, on the Mississippi uh, in, in Memphis. So, <clears throat> so again, that energy continued and we did everything that we needed to do to, uh, to have this, the second conference. Uh, and then the charter, we had one of the legal things we had to do was get a charter established, and I, I didn't know all the legal uh, ramifications, but we did that, and you can see a, a replica of that. Uh, it's not actually the original, I don't think. You got a closer look at it than I did, Mara, since you broke the glass. <laughs> 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 she replaced the glass, it was damaged in transit. Uh, um, but anyway, we got that, that, the charter was issued on May 2nd uh, of 1979, and then the third conference was uh, in Omaha, and that was the first time that Kansas State was involved with uh, our group, not yet a, an official association, but they managed that conference. Somebody had come to the second conference from the Kansas State um, 
continuing ed office basically and said they would like to handle this for us and we said all right we'll give it a try so that started our relationship with uh, with Kansas State so that was for the uh, the third conference a um, couple of in interesting side notes about that that conference we were to go out to our business meeting uh, and introduce new officers and everything that we had to have to have a charter we had to have officers we had all of that chosen uh, we had National Academic Advising Association as the name that was accepted, uh, but we couldn't think of the acronym. We first acronym that you know that we the natural true acronym was NAAA. <laughs> Everybody looked at each other and said, "Nah, <laughs> nah, we're not doing that." So, so we had to try for something else, and we came up with Nakata. Or, at lunch, it took us a half an hour to decide how to pronounce N-A-C-A-D-A. -A -A. So it was Nakata. Was it Nakata? Was it Nakata? We ended up with Nakata, and that's what we've been using uh, ever since. But I still hear people making, making uh, mispronunciations of our association uh, this, this many years later. Uh, so the next, the fourth national conference, this is another kind of a side story with me. I had been involved in ACPA before. And <clears throat> I was uh, on the board, uh, board of whatever they called it uh, at that time on their commissions, on Commission 1 of ACPA. And the people who were other members wanted me to run for the chair of ACPA. And I said, I'm really thinking about this new association that we're forming. It's about to form, and I think I'd rather, and I'm planning to run for the president of that. And they said, well, the vice president's going to run, so just we don't want this to be like a student election where you only have one person running, and it's not really an election. Uh, so I said, all right, go ahead. Who won? <laughs> I no, no inkling that I would, was ever going to win that election. I thought for sure that the vice president would get elected. So here I am, and I did get also elected then as president of Nakata. So I'm holding two national offices at the same time, trying to, trying to juggle that. That was, that was quite a challenge, but uh, fun as well. Uh, so that was, that was the fourth, uh, the third conference, and then the fourth conference is when, uh, that's when I became president, actually. It was at the fourth conference. And Tony basically kind of stepped out of higher ed altogether after that. Uh, she wanted to finish out, get the organization going once, obviously, she had no idea when, when we met in the elevator that uh, there was even going to be an association, but uh, she was planning to go to grad school and did uh, after she finished as that first year as president, went to uh, McGill to work on her, on her doctorate. Uh, you can see out in the uh, uh, the mini museum out there the logo that was we had a competition for the logo and and I had a copy of some of the other submissions that you might find a little amusing. Uh, you look at some of those, but that happened uh, in 1980. Uh, that was a kind of a special conference for me because many of you have read higher ed literature, student affairs literature, and I had actually. Uh, recruited Bill Perry and Lee Kneffelkamp to be two keynote speakers at that conference. I had met them, uh, I'd met Bill Perry at an ACPA conference where he was a keynoter there, and uh, Lee Kneffelkamp became a faculty member in the department where I got my degree at, uh, at College Park, Maryland. So that was a super conference. I became the first president and they were our keynoters. Uh, a couple of other highlights that happened along the way. <clears throat> At another, <laughs> another ACPA conference, uh, I can remember this, I was sitting at lunch with Tony, Ted Miller, and Roger Winston. Ted Miller, as you probably know, uh, how many are familiar with CAS standards? Well, Ted Miller was the father of the CAS standards. He, it was his brainstorm. He's the one who really started all of the efforts to get the CAS standards underway. And there's, there still is a subgroup within ACPA of uh, was called ACAFAD, which was the Academic Affairs Administrators. And that was the only association that had anything to do with academic advising. So Ted was going to have that group write the standards for advising. And he, he knew, I knew him, he, you know, so he said, you guys got a new association. You're the National Academic Advising Association. Can you get somebody to help write the standards? Uh, said, okay, well, there's a membership fee. How much? $100. Tony's sitting there. We're not paying $100 to join. Uh, Tony, come on. If, 
if we don't pay the $100 and write those standards, somebody else is going to be writing the standards for academic advising, and we're the National Academic Advising Association. Okay, so I won that argument as well with, with Tony. St very good friends. These are all friendly arguments that we had, but, but we did, did become uh, a, a member of CAS at that time, and you know the standards have been uh, revised a couple of times. <clears throat> uh, we, it, Dan Wesley was the person that we put in charge of doing that, and you can see some of the correspondence about that out there at the table, and the first draft, very first draft of the, uh, of the standards uh, that, that he developed. One of the other things, uh, I, I've got the, the Nakata budget on here, and the Nakata executive office people are here are going to go back and rat on me, but uh, it's all right. Uh, you can see out there, too, uh, our first budget. If you looked at it very closely, our total budget for the first year of the association was $18,000, okay, 10 of which was in a CD that had been left over from those first couple of conferences, so we had to do something with the money. So we put it in a CD and had $10,000 there. The total budget was $18,000. Uh, the last, I tried to get this from the executive office, but the last thing I could find on the website was 2013, uh, Nakata's budget was over $2 million uh, at that point. Well deserved, I'm not complaining about that, but that's the kind of growth that we've, that, you know, that we've seen. Uh, you know, both in membership, 15, have we hit 15,000 yet, or we're close? We, we have, we have hit 15,000, okay. We started with 400, uh, 450, something like that, I guess. <clears throat> so there's some growth and a little bit of history back there. Uh, we knew we needed a professional journal. So that was my next goal. I wanted to be a journal editor, and I'm so glad they did not appoint me. Because I, if it hadn't been for Ed Jones, who was named the first uh, editor of the journal, he had already published his own work. He was at the uh, University of uh, Washington in Seattle, and he had published several uh, books on his own, so he know, knew how to go about starting publications. I would have been starting from scratch. I didn't know anything about it. I enjoyed writing, but you know, I didn't know anything about uh, starting a publication effort. So. Uh, anyway, so Ed Jones became the journal editor, and, and uh, we started from early on, and I'll, I'm going to come back to this in a minute, but uh, a definition of advising, okay? We are still talking about a definition of advising, and people have been talking for years. You look at that 1979 publication that's out there, and then you look at these are, those are my copies of the journal out there, too. Volume 1, uh, Issue 1, uh, Page 1, Line 2, okay, is where uh, John Borgard, who wrote that article about a, a pragmatic philosophy of academic advising. So there was some thinking going on about that beyond the people who were involved in the association cited my other document in there with a definition of, of academic advising. But nobody liked that idea, I guess, because we, we still don't have one. As we grew, and some people know this who've been around, that the idea was always for us to be able to communicate with upper level administrators, with legislators now, with, with whomever we needed to communicate, we needed a, a, a back of a business card definition. Okay, so. I'm skipping ahead for a second just to give, keep the relationship here. We finally came up with a concept of academic advising that's about four pages long, you know, <laughs> not quite, but you're not going to get it on the back of a business card uh, at any time. So that's, that's still an issue. We really don't have a definition, and I don't think we will get one that's going to be acceptable to everybody because I believe then and I believe now it is too verse diverse uh, a field and so heterogeneous in population and so forth that it's, it's never going to accomplish everything that we do and that our colleagues do and the people that we want to respect us uh, uh, are going to buy into, especially faculty. And I'm not bashing faculty, it's just, you know, that, that was a, a concern of mine that, that faculty, teaching faculty would probably not uh, buy into uh, something that was, was not theirs. And that's just a personal uh, opinion of mine. <clears throat> Uh, the next thing on here, the, uh, the awards program. Uh, for the awards program, I guess the first awards were given in, yeah, in 1984. Um, 
Virginia Gordon and Davy Crockett. Anybody heard of Davy Crockett? <laughs> the David Crockett, David, he didn't go by Davy, he went by David <laughs> Crockett, who was with ACT, and ACT did a lot of funding of, uh, of our association in the, in the early years. And Virginia Gordon, Dave Crockett, and myself sat in a hotel room for two days at the Philadelphia airport creating the advising awards. Uh, and then we put out the call for the uh, for nominations, and then the three of us, well, Dave flew Virginia and I out to uh, Iowa City, ACT, and we made the decisions on that first set of advising awards, which were given in, uh, in 1984. Um, <clears throat> during that time, as we're growing, we're getting closer to current, current days here. Uh, 1988, uh, Hal Caldwell at Ball State University was, uh, I forget what his field was that he taught in, but he was very computer savvy and, and started the ACAD, ACADV listserv email with five people. There were five members when that started, okay? I don't know how much it grew to. I know I joined it, but, uh, but eventually, you know, email took over, the internet uh, and everything took over everything. So, but that was kind of, a, I, I think, a real, real milestone. Certainly in 1990, uh, the executive office, I mean, we were just getting, you know, too big. And, and we were all still working out of our offices and so forth all around the country. And communication was, was more and more difficult and trying to get things printed and just everything that goes along with, with running an organization uh, was just getting to be too much. And Kansas State had been all along been working with us in the conferences. So they had a continuing ed office. Uh, regional conferences first started in 1984. I was opposed to that. <laughs> I, was no, I had no more influence, you know, I was out of being the president. But uh, regional conferences began as soon as we were in association. You know, people said, well, people, you know, we can't get people to pay for uh, our, our staff and so forth to go to a national conference. It's too much cost for travel and so forth and so on. We need it closer by so we can get more people there. And I kept saying, we've got to establish a national presence first. You know, if, if people all start going to regional conferences, I'm afraid the national membership and or national uh, at least attendance which is still the biggest fundraiser or money maker for the association would diminish uh, so I argued against it but I finally lost that argument uh, beat Tony a couple times but this one I didn't I didn't win uh, but it, it's obviously a good thing and the first two uh, were region one and region four had the first two regional conferences in, uh, in 1984, and obviously they're a big part of the association now. But at the time, I had a different opinion about uh, regional conferences. Uh, so anyway, uh, the Clearinghouse. Um, you find the Clearinghouse you know, on the web now, you get all kinds of things. I'm on it all the time too, finding things. But the Clearinghouse originally started in Virginia Gordon's office where she had articles on advising and student development and undecided students and whatever she could find uh, in filing cabinets in her office and people could request from her uh, literature, research uh, articles or whatever on a topic related to advising and she would get them out, Xerox them and mail them off and that was the beginning of the clearinghouse. We actually called it the clearinghouse and then officially George Steele took it over uh, doing the same thing initially, but then uh, finally when, you know, when we got on the web and everything, why uh, we started getting it much more uh, an electronic format. Uh, summer institutes have been mentioned quite a bit, so that's, you know, th those are, are very popular for sure. Um, the reincorporation, we were incorporated here in Vermont because that's where, you know, we started. And so we had been in Kansas, at Kansas State for a long time. Everything was out there, so they d went through the uh, uh, legal processes to get the charter then transferred to Kansas. So it's now uh, reincorporated in, uh, in Kansas. Uh, started a strategic plan, had the core values. Um, Canadians, how many Canadians are here? All right, okay, good, good. 
It was a struggle, I'll tell you. You had some strong advocates early on to be able to get recognized as, you know, as another area where advising happened, you know, but uh, you were across the border and it uh, didn't work. Now we're the global community, so uh, there you go. Uh, but that was 1994, the website established in, uh, in 95. Uh, let's go to one more slide here. <clears throat> first, first conference outside the U.S. now that Canada was recognized uh, was in Ottawa one month after 9-11. There was a very serious concern, obviously, that that conference might not happen, uh, but it did, and had very good attendance. Uh, you know, so we were we were fortunate to be able to uh, to continue that uh, that conference. <coughs> uh, major reorganization uh, plan went on with the executive office and the overall governance of the association. Two thousand two, graduate certificate was introduced in two thousand three. That's been moved to a master's degree program, and now, hopefully, am I letting any cats out of the bag here? It's okay? It's legit, okay. Uh, next fall, right? Fall 19 will be a doctoral program. Uh, I, as I understand from Ken, it's a track within the leadership program or something. Right, right, so now you can get a PhD. Uh, in academic advising if you want to do that. I'm not starting over, but uh, <laughs> <coughs> uh, the assessment seminar. I was on the first uh, faculty group for that assessment seminar. Started out as a day and a half uh, seminar. We realized after one time doing that, one and a half days was not enough in 2004 to talk about advising and assessment of an assessment of advising, so we moved it to uh, to be an institute, uh, so it could go two and a half days then, and uh, followed that suit. Uh, the concept statement, as you see, was was uh, written and, and adopted in 2006. The planning for that started in 2004, as uh, Betsy McCall Riggins called me. She was president, and she said, we've got the authorization from the uh, executive board uh, to uh, write a definition for academic advising. Again, okay, we were gonna do this. And, I, and I, at first I said, no, I said, it's too complex. We're never gonna write a definition that's gonna be acceptable. Well, we put together a task force. It worked, literally went four years and went through, I don't know how many iterations, and we finally realized, okay, let's just call it a concept. This is what we're talking about. And that concept was built on the, our phrase that we were using at the time, and I have used forever, that advising is teaching. And I still advise by that, you know, by that uh, mantra, if you will. And let me tell you why I think that way, and, and I hope you take this away. Every time I and you have a student into your office, there's an opportunity to teach something. Every student that comes in, I don't know what I'm gonna teach them when they come in, but I, it's gonna be something that they're gonna learn when they leave that office. And, and for years also, that's my simple way of advising or, or thinking about it, and a simple way of assessing it is, when the students leave the office, ask them one question, what'd you learn? And you get probably the most uh, reliable and valid uh, data than, than you uh, will get otherwise. So that's another little editorial, cynical, uh, preferential comment. Um, so then we, we had the name change with uh, the global community and certainly well-deserved. We know we've been to how many foreign countries, continents, uh, and you know, it it's really is uh, a global community now where we've got uh, people coming from all parts of the world to the national conference. Uh, so that was a good change. I, I was glad to see that we still kept Nakata uh, as, the, uh, as the name, the shorthand name of the association and the global community. It's like every conference program you read, you know, there's X colon, X, Y, Z, A, B, C, D, E, F, G, you know, after the, after the colon, so uh, I was pleased to, uh, to see that happen. Um, I, I wanna reflect just a couple of things on critical issues uh, historically. In 1971, 
uh, the association, board of directors, whatever we called the, it was, I guess it was board of directors at that time, uh, had 10 critical issues in advising. I'm not gonna give you all of them, but I'll highlight a couple. Increased recognition and prom promotion of the field, okay? Is advising a profession and defining academic advising? That was 1987. 2004, planning for the future, development statement of definition for academic advising. How many years later was that, 17 years later? Foster awareness of NACADA and the advising profession. Consider formal advising certification. This is another thing, Virginia, this is, this is one thing that Virginia Gordon and I disagreed on. Uh, she wanted to have some kind of a certification process for advisors and I said, you know, faculty are not, most of the advisors at that time and still numerically are still the largest group of advisors across the country. There are more faculty members or advisors. They're not gonna do whatever she was proposing and, and what people were talking about to earn the certificate to put up on their wall. Faculty members don't care about that for the most part. They want rewards in terms of promotion and tenure and so forth. So anyway, uh, my concept was that we use an accreditation model and accredit advising programs. Well, neither one of them went through, so we both lost that one, I guess, <laughs> but anyway. So where are we? Where are we now? Uh, we, I think we have a few challenges. These are somewhat my own personal choices, but uh, you know, I, I think we hear a lot about student success, right? <clears throat> How many believe in student success? Oh, some of you don't, okay. <laughs> all right, okay, all right. Well, I'm going to give you an opportunity to, uh, to decide. The student who is not admitted to a preferred academic program of study or graduate school, but earned a 3.86 average and a degree, is that student a success or not? How many say no? Okay, everybody agrees that student's a success, even though he or she didn't get into the graduate program. All right, how about the student? with a 3.86 GPA, who drops out, leaves the institution to get a super job? That student a success or not? That student's a success also. Okay, anybody say no? All right, I wanna tell you what you're up against here in a minute. But, uh, <laughs> how about the first generation student who strives to make his family proud uh, after having attended school for a couple of years, this could be a community college, four-year school, but leaves to go back and help the family. A student a success or not? I, I see a lot of, I don't know. How many say no? One person. All right, you're brave, you're brave. Okay. Uh, First generation student who stri oh, that's the one I just did, isn't it? Did I skip one? Maybe I did. All right, that's okay, you got the point. Uh, all right, so let's look at the next slide after this. So uh, I got a couple of notes on it. <coughs> I'll put it up here. The answer to your question is, it depends. Who's defining student success? And it's not us, all right? It's affecting us, it's challenging us, but it's not us who's defining success or failure, uh, you know, at, at least in my opinion, because all of these other entities are uh, defining it for us. Institutions may have a, a, a definition or a criterion for success, that you don't buy into. Uh, how about legislators? You know, writing legis are there any elected officials uh, in here? Uh, legislators, we just had one passed. I I'm not gonna go into the detail, but legislators, I wrote, the provost wanted us to respond to it, so I said, all right, here's one of my cynical responses that I'm gonna give you. This is another example of legislators dictating what we do on our campuses with nobody at the table to tell them what we do, especially on our level, on our ground, where we're advising students. They have no concept of what it means to be advising students for the most part. So yeah, I'm anti-legislator. 
Uh, how about parents? How do parents decide whether or not a student is a success? Uh, faculty, how do they decide or how do they classify a student whether they're successful or not? Employers, we're seeing, uh, you know, people are saying, we've heard a lot of talk about soft skills from employers. These students all have degrees, okay? But they can't do anything. They don't have any skills. They got degrees, paper, no, no skills. That's what employers are telling us. Outside funding agencies, they want to see retention rates, graduation rates, and you have to show that you're doing poorly in order to get money for uh, certain kinds of grants. So a little bit of a, an odd thing there. How about us? Anybody ask, ask you how you define student success? Uh, how about students? Never ask students. I heard a great quote at a conference, <clears throat> and it's something I think you know, we do. Uh, and the quote that the person gave was that a student came to her and said, don't talk about us, talk with us. You know, and that's, and we're all doing exactly the opposite. We're all talking about students. Let's do this because students want this, students won't do that, but we never ask the students if that's really true. And obviously not true in, in uh, all of the time, but certainly it's what we do. Just a quick <clears throat> update, what's happening? The completion ad agenda is driving what student success is supposed to be, graduation. And we're measured by graduation rates, not by numbers of graduates, which for me is illogical. When you're looking at the way that, that outsiders are defining student success, they are not talking about student success, they're talking about institutional success but not any of those uh, dimensions or groups that is talking about student success and measuring student success is measuring student success on an individual student level. I think we can do that. I'm not gonna go into that you know, right now. Um, but everything is focused on, uh, on, on uh, <clears throat> graduation rates. Uh, and by the way, I put the little thing at the bottom that uh, they don't include transfer students. You know, all the retention rates, you know, are only on first time, full time freshman students. You know, that's how they're still calculated. I believe that's gonna change in the next 50 years. <laughs> all right, all right, you're still awake. Good, thank you. No, I'm gonna, I'm gonna I think maybe within five to 10 years, I think we'll have a different formula for uh, institutional success measured by retention and graduation rates and perhaps other things uh, as well. Uh, and I think what happens if our institutions and particularly our institutional leaders and our legislators and uh, uh, central office personnel and so forth who are looking at, at student success only by these other metrics, they're putting the pressure on us to get students to graduate. You know, we don't care what they're going to major in. We don't care if they're doing well. We don't care how much debt they have to go into. Just get them to graduate because that's going to make us look better. And I think it puts us in an ethical dilemma, uh, you know, when we're sitting across that table and say, you know, I, I, I'm going to take this opportunity to teach something, but I got to teach them how to graduate first because that's what we're being measured on. So it's something that I think is a, is a, is a real concern. Uh, so the second challenge, uh, I had a couple of quotes I was going to read you, but it's too, related, too much related to what I've already s talked about. And I'm going to get the hook here in a minute. So, <laughs> <clears throat> the, uh, the next one is challenging our profession. Okay? I, you know, I've, we've seen, what I was going to read you was uh, we had a task force in 1990, late 80s, early 90s that had a task force uh, on advising as a profession. There's a report out there on the table if you want, want to read that. We were thinking about, wondering about that being a profession way back then. And it's been argued in different circles and so forth ever since. Um, Lee Schaefer, uh, unfortunately, has, has passed, but he was our editor for quite a while, our journal editor for a long time, and a good friend, but I really disagreed with him on his uh, <clears throat> measures of whether or not academic advising was a profession. I, I, I want to go back and look in every journal article and every, every newsletter since the beginning and see how many articles actually use the word profession. Uh, and we use it all the time. But somebody writes an article and now there's another one that's just come out in the last year in the journal saying, oh, nope, you're not a profession because you didn't meet these kinds of criteria. 
I'll give you my cynicism on that in a minute. But uh, here were the, the, the criteria that uh, Lee was using when he wrote his, his uh, article about being a profession and said, we're not a profession. And he used the, the criteria used by sociologists. That was his field. Uh, Full-time occupation. Well, I think we meet that uh, all right now. Uh, has schools of training for new recruits. We actually have that now. Uh, some of you in here have earned those, those degrees. Uh, has a professional association, here we are, and has a code of ethics. We have the core values, so we, you know, similar to uh, uh, a code of ethics. So I don't see why people are still arguing that we're not a profession. Uh, I've never felt we were not, uh, we're not a profession. I've always felt we, we were. So uh, what do we do with those challenges that we now have? What, 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 what can we do? Practice what we do and get better at it. Okay, that's, that's my prescription for this. Uh, you're doing that through professional development here. You've been to conference programs already. You've got another uh, day and a half to go to, uh, to learn more, to become better at what you do. Uh, when you're working with students, think about student success, but don't let other people define it. Create, help create that experience and take that opportunity to teach so that those students are all positioned, positioned to earn a high quality degree, which Lumina uh, the Lumina Foundation has used as its uh, definition in meeting its uh, 2025 goals. Get them positioned to obtain a degree. If they don't get it, there's probably a very good reason for it. It could be financial, it could be family, it could be medical, I, there are all kinds of reasons, you know, why, it, uh, why they're uh, not earning that degree. But our job is to get them in position to do that or help them get into that position. And advocate for change. I, I guess I can't talk uh, enough about that because, um, you know, sometimes people need a nudge, you know, or a little oomph to, to get going. Uh, as I wrote to myself, be a nudge, be a pastor, be a cynic. Uh, I'm all three uh, on my campus. They know it, you know, but they still invite me to be on committees. I don't know why that is. Uh, and contribute to... Uh, our colleagues uh, through your writing, through your presentations, uh, through your conferences, through your communicating with each other at situations like that, through all of the communication vehicles that we have through the association now. You know, help each other. That's, that's I think, what we're, we're all about. Uh, so, in sum, I hope that you can appreciate the Nakata history that I've tried to provide for you. Uh, Always work toward the success of your students uh, in whatever that means and in variable uh, contexts. And when it comes to whether or not we're a profession, you can read it. Get over it. <laughs> okay? We're a profession. Okay? That's my uh, sense, at, at least. So, uh, having said all that, well, I thank you for this opportunity to, uh, to talk to you. Uh, Sure. Oh, wait till I tell my friends I got a standing O. Wow. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. What, uh, well, let's try it here for a minute. Okay, if it's okay. Sure. All right. I had to put this slide up there, okay? That's, this is my favorite. I have a little sign on my desk. You all should have one. You all should have a, a sign on your desk that said everybody's entitled to your opinion, my opinion, okay? So if there's any burning question that somebody would like, I mean, we're gonna be at socializing in, uh, at the reception, but if anybody has a question that they wanna ask now, I'd be happy to try to answer it. Or, I hate to proselytize, but I'm doing another session tomorrow morning if you wanna be more uh, specific or personal or something you think is too specific here. So um, otherwise, I think uh, it's time to eat, right? Or, yes. Oh, and, um, and drink, if anybody can figure out who, uh, who, had, who I stole that joke from. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> thank you, Tom. Um, on behalf of the conference committee, we have a, a little thank you for you to remember your visit back to Vermont and for sharing your stories with us. So another bag, of course, because you love <laughs> Nakata bags. He has all of them, every single I, I'm one. I'm the only person that's been to every conference. <laughs> every Seriously. single one. So we have a. You can help me with all of them. Oh. 
we have a little sweatshirt for you from the University of oh, Vermont. Thank so. You. Thank you. <laughs> thank you.